Autocratic's RPG a Day spans the month of August, and this is the 31st question of the event, the last question for the Casting Shadows blog and channel. Today we will answer the final question in the series of questions for RPG a Day for 2016. It seems like we've been talking about role-playing games for quite a while, but then again it seems like hardly any time at all. Today's question is a bit of a doozy. What was the best piece of advice you have been given about and fill in the blank for your game, your game of choice? So, what is the best piece of advice you've been given for running in or playing that game? Maybe you don't have a specific game that you consider to be your game of choice or your chosen game, or maybe you're finding it difficult as you sit down and, and think about what game you would choose among all the others to share advice from. So maybe it's a play style. All of these fall within the, the bounds of the question. The space for the question is very small. And the questions are prompts. They're supposed to be as open as possible. So take the question, run with it, and enjoy yourself. Have fun. Be positive. Very simple rules for RPG a day. So what is the best piece of advice I have ever been given for my games? Well, my answer, I do have one answer, but to get to that one answer is kind of convoluted. So please bear with me. And this is something that I put together. I knew at the time it was important. I got immediate evidence that it was important. We got direct feedback right away at the efficacy of this advice, and I've followed it ever since. But it was such a long time ago that, you know, you forget things that were groundbreaking discoveries become foundational experiences, and then they become things you don't question, and they become things that you might not remember to relate to other people, you might not remember to share. And while I've tried to share this advice with other people through the blog and, and through this channel, it's one of the reasons why they were created in the first place. Things aren't always clear. So, as baldly as I can state it, will be the answer here, but you'll have to follow me, you know, through a bit of a maze first. So a few days ago, I talked about a challenging and rewarding game. That was when I tried to get my head around running pulp games. And what made it possible was running pulp games through Ubiquity. Just there was a, an alchemy of circumstance and luck and kindness and enthusiasm that all came together with the right group of players at the right time in my life to make it possible for me to get over my own perceptual barrier that I could not run pulp heroic games. Now, one of the elements in all of that was a piece of advice I was directly given about assigning difficulties in Ubiquity. I was applying difficulties kind of by instinct, by habit, from the way I would have done it in pretty much any other dice pool game, without taking Ubiquity's special characteristics into consideration. And the person who gave me the advice, Daniel Potter, uh, if you ever go onto the Ubiquity forums anywhere, you'll, you'll find him as Harry or Potter, he shared his longer experience with the game and just said, hey, you know, don't assign the difficulties that way. Assign them this way. It's, it's more fun. It makes more sense and blah, blah, blah. And he was totally right. As soon as he said it, you know, you have one of those, wow, I've, I've been stupid moments, which are so important for learning a game. And what he probably doesn't realize his advice did for me, it reminded me of this earlier advice, which I will get to in a minute. But I was taking myself in the wrong direction because I wasn't aware of something. And his advice from his different perspective put me back on the path I was trying to go. Very valuable. Now, very recently, I did a long read through of a game called Circle of Hands. And if you're interested in what that game might be like, please check out those videos. It is exactly what it says. It's a read through 
cold. I have no idea what I'm going to experience when the video starts and we move, we move through it. So that game is written in a style I wish I had encountered 20 years ago, a little more, when I had a lot of questions and the only person I had to talk to them about was very open-minded, very helpful. You can hear about him in an earlier video about the, the gamer who most affected the way that you play. But he didn't really game from the same point of view that I do. He was definitely willing to listen to me explain and help me put labels on concepts so I could get handholds on them to find my way toward what would eventually be my style of gaming. But it wasn't one he shared. He couldn't he couldn't help me explore it from the inside. So his advice to me has been the most important piece of advice for running games my way that I've ever gotten. And I was reminded of that whole experience by uncovering someone who writes about gaming the way that I think about it, who is putting my unspoken thoughts into the printed word. And that's very reassuring. And it makes me wish, like I said, that I had encountered his games earlier. And the person I'm talking about is Ron Edwards. And recently I did this read through of Circle of Hands, as I said, and in it I was uncovering or uncovering attitudes which were mine. Points of view which are mine. Statements that I've made. And said in a way that is clearly not the way that I speak. So the impact is there, like you're making this connection with somebody else that you've never met, may never meet, but they see the gaming world, or maybe even the world, the way that you do. And they had uncovered the same truth that Tom's advice had goaded me to recognize and embrace. So what am I talking about? It's very simple. It's it's a truism almost. And you may see me post it from, from time to time on the internet. And it's that simply to know yourself. I like to phrase it as know thyself, but know yourself. Be aware of what you want. Now, why is this advice important? Gaming should be satisfying. You'll hear everybody everywhere say, gaming's gotta be fun. If it's not fun, you're doing it wrong. And there's enough truth in that that we need to actually look at that statement. Fun doesn't just happen. That's not the only way that we obtain fun. Sometimes there needs to be some structure. Look at sports. You know, sports played for fun, not sports played for dollars. And you'll see what I'm talking about. Sometimes there need to be rules and people need to understand the rules. And the better they are at working within those rules, the greater skill that they have of manipulating whatever it is that the, the game is about, the more fun people are having. As the challenge rises and a skill rises to meet the challenge, there's fun to be had. Our role-playing games are similar to that. If you go to the table and you're not really sure what it is that you want out of the game and you are unsatisfied, what are you going to do next? You're just going to change games and hope to find one that's more satisfying? Are you going to change people that you play with and hope that they'll be a better match for your personality? Or are you going to actually explore what it is that you want out of the game and see if it's possible to get it? with that game and with those people right here and now. If it's not, great, go find another game. But how do you choose that other game if you don't know what you want and you don't know if the group that you're gonna play it with can deliver it? This is the foundation of the advice that my friend Tom gave to me. And it came from a very fun place. We had both recognized that we tend to, to field the same kind of characters, particularly in new games. We would play the lone wolf. We would play the horrifyingly competent, right? Self-controlled, unconnected, disconnected, right? Character. Now we played them in different ways. We had different reasons for this and we had different interests, things that we wanted to do with those characters, but the template was the same. We were playing a character who could completely survive on their own without the party, whatever that 
might be Shadowrun or, or Vampire or Werewolf or whatever. We were creating characters that didn't need anybody else. And the only reason that they were with the group was because you wanted to play. So this is a huge problem. This is not a good kind of character to have in a game, particularly when the players don't know each other very well or they aren't meshing. Right? And these were the experiences that we were having in those days because people wanted to play the games that we were playing. These games were new. People were excited about them. They wanted an opportunity to play them. So our tables were open to newcomers, people we didn't know. And these kinds of characters, when they appeared, they were problems. And of course, as the game master, you step in and say, hey, let's make some changes. But in the absence of understanding of where these characters come from, the suggestions can break the character concept or, or they can have an impact on gameplay, which you just don't want. What you need is for the player to feel able to feel the character that they want to field, but be challenged to make it fit. And it's not enough to say, well, we're all friends. Right? Real in-character reasons. A place for the character to go. Friction at the start, which becomes friendship somewhere along the way, perhaps. Or mutual need. Or something broken inside the character and the only thing that can fit the only thing that can fix, the only thing that can fill that spot is something that the group offers. It's not easy. Now, Tom actually challenged me to do this. He challenged me to make the worst isolated, isolationist, disconnected, disaffected lone wolf character I possibly could. We did this for Shadowrun campaign. We talk about a fair bit on the channel. And I did it. And he helped me. He made sure that this character was totally unrelatable. And that was the challenge. From the very first session, I had to take this character and make it be and need to be a part of the group. Stands as one of my most memorable characters of all time. Not just because that was a fantastic group to play with and it was a fantastic campaign and it was just a great time for gaming in my life. All of those things were true. People I played with are still friends now and they're amazing people. But also that challenge. Knowing what I wanted. Knowing what was wrong with it. Challenging myself to fix it in a way that made sense and kept the sanctity, the purity of what I wanted, right? All of these things and making it happen. That was the advice I got. Know what you want, know how to get it, find the game where it can happen, find the people it can happen with, understand the whole flow of the process so it can be reproduced, and then sit back and enjoy the fun that arises. So this is kind of a long answer. May not be understood by everyone who listens to it, but that's just part of the game. RPG A Day for 2016 has been a treat. For those of you who have been watching my channel and reading my blog, thank you very much. For those of you who have shared it with other people and in so doing allowed me to uh, learn about other channels and be exposed to other ideas, thank you even more for that. That is the heart of what RPG A Day is all about. So with this question now complete, I will close RPG A Day for the Casting Shadows blog and channel for 2016. Thank you all. The RPG Brigade have been proud to sponsor RPG A Day for 2016, an idea initially created by Dave Chapman for the Autocratic blog and role-playing gamers everywhere. If you've enjoyed it, please use the hashtag RPG A Day Find interesting responses and share them far and wide. See you next year.